everyone, and welcome to Norma Jean Discovering Truths. This is our companion podcast to the Maryland Behind the Icon series. My name is Randall Libero. I'm the co-producer, co-writer, and uh, supervising editor for the series, and my collaborators are part of this discussion as well. I'm Gary Vitaco Robles. I'm a co-producer, co-writer, and I'm the author of Icon, The Lifetimes and Films of Marilyn Monroe. Hi, everybody. I'm Nina Bosky. I'm also one of the producers and all around, uh, I put my my hands in just about every pot. <laughs> we're Maryland's three musketeers. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're her, we're her uh, cheerleading squad. So this is a conversation about episode two, which is titled A Promise of Hope, a period in uh, 1961 when Marilyn is released from the hospital and she's renewing a relationship with Joe DiMaggio. And they travel together to Florida, and Marilyn is planning her next production as a producer and uh, actress. The big part of why we chose this episode, as which is a continuation of episode one, uh, one of the main reasons that as a writer that I felt it was important to tell the story is this last part of Marilyn's life really began with her release from Payne Whitney and Release from Columbia, which we document in this episode. But also, most importantly, it was the reconnection to Joe DiMaggio, who was there for the rest of her life. And it was the rekindling of their relationship. For both of them, it was an extremely important time in their lives as people, Marilyn being a movie star and Joe being a former famous baseball player, but as individuals who had hoped to come back to a relationship which they both felt very strongly about uh, and they truly loved each other and you can see that in all sorts of ways and we, we um, did the best we could to portray that in the episode, how, how well they knew each other's little habits and everything. But mostly for me as a writer, I have to say that seeing how Joe had become a different man, he talked about it in episode one and in this episode we really begin to see that Joe was following through on his promise to Marilyn. That's why this episode is called The Promise of Hope. You it's get... a little sweeter too compared to the first episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so in the as you as you if you've only heard episode one and two and are listening to this conversation, we talked a lot in if you heard the the previous Norma Jean Discovering Truths, one of the things I also wanted to say is we wanted to have a a very different type of episode where it was very happy and very positive and very upbeat and fun. And as you listen to the rest of these uh, episodes in the series, you're never going to know what you're going to get. You're never going to, as we get into the, the drama of what's going on, uh, we hoped to surprise all of you listeners with doing things which are completely unexpected as much as we could as we cover Marilyn's life in different ways. Sometimes we jump back in time. Sometimes we jump forward in time. So we wanted to give you a feeling of how these moments in Marilyn's life relate, the pattern of her life, how things connect in her life. That way you can get a much better picture of her as a person, as an individual, and really understand her challenges. It's yeah. also a period in her life that's not often explored. So much focus on the marriage to Arthur Miller and then the divorce and then the last months of Marilyn's life. But there was an entire year in which she was not working, but she was spending a significant amount of time with Joe DiMaggio in New York. And the professional focus for Marilyn was that NBC television special, which is rarely discussed. But her interest was um, exploring television, which was a relatively new medium. And many uh, former successful actresses uh, who were now beginning to age in the motion picture industry had found new opportunities in television and television dramas um, such as and Loretta. And she was also, she was also going to be um, a producer too. I mean, she was going to be a lot more than just a actress on television. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. they, the television was giving her um, many more rights in the production than she had experienced at 20th Century Fox. This was also an opportunity for her to to work with, for the first time, uh, a female producer, Anne Marlowe. And so um, this would have been uh, an NBC color uh, televised um, drama. Um, and many months were spent 
working on it. And what actually uh, resulted in it not taking place was Marilyn was insistent upon uh, Lee Strasberg being the director because she felt safe working with him. And she really believed that that he was the man to um, direct this. However, Lee Strasberg didn't have a lot of experience in the television medium. And uh, when NBC would not sign him, Marilyn began to lose interest. And unfortunately, it never took place. But, but pro professionally for Marilyn, much of 1961 was spent trying to make this happen. It would have actually been filmed in a studio in Brooklyn, not too far from Marilyn's primary residence in Manhattan at the time. Interesting. Gary, you know, we have this scene where Marilyn and Joe go down to Florida and you live in Florida. So you're very connected to the area. Tell us a little bit more about the tides and the history behind that. Yeah, the, the Tampa Bay area has that claim to fame and the old timers still talk about it. So, so the Tampa Bay area is comprised of uh, Tampa and St. Petersburg and the beaches. And I live about 45 minutes north of that area. And when I was in college, especially, there were still many old timers who remembered this visit, who were actually present on the beach and saw Marilyn and Joe. And I had many opportunities to meet people who had actually seen them or interacted with them. And what was some of the, the comments people made? Because that's really interesting if, if you had firsthand knowledge of seeing them. Well, Jason Dow was a, a gentleman who told me he had met Marilyn um, when he was uh, 13 years old at, at the Tides. And, and we, we recreated his experience with Marilyn. He went there hoping to meet her at sunset. And he spent the whole day there. And toward the end of the day, when the sun was setting, he started to build a sand castle, hoping to catch her attention which he claims he certainly did. And I do believe his story. I, I could remember looking into his face and his eyes as he went back in time and re-experienced this meeting, which was very, very sweet and very tender. He connected me with other folks at the Tides. The Tides was a, a, was a resort. It was one of the longest. And it's not, it's not a, up anymore, right? Unfortunately, no. It was built in the 30s, and it, it boasted itself as having such a large uh, beachfront property. It just went on endlessly. It was a whole complex. And not only did it attract international visitors and celebrities, but it was also a, they called it a bath club, which was really a country club for this region, which is on the beaches and it offered pools. And in college, um, it was mm -hmm. very common for me and others to spend spring break there in March, which was the time Marilyn and Joe were there the last week of March, the beginning of April. And I would often go spend some time there. And what was unique about the Tides is that it was family owned and it had many loyal long-term employees. So those who were working in the late 50s and the early 60s continued to work there into the late 80s and the early 90s when I was a guest. And so the cabana boy that, um, that we hear uh, in the episode- Yeah, that's played by Jack Drinker. He was actually, uh, he started the Tides in 1960 when he was 17 years old, and he was still renting out the cabanas. So wow. when I was under the, the cabanas there, I really wanted to pick his brain and he was more than happy to talk with um, me or anyone else about uh, his experiences with Joe and Marilyn. And they were servers in the dining room. I remember um, an elderly gentleman and an elderly lady, Hester was her name. They told me about serving the DiMaggio's. In fact, when I was in college, I bought a 1962 Cadillac from an elderly lady, Mrs. Hotchkiss. <laughs> and uh, she lived in Bel Air Beach and she had retired to Florida. And the first thing she and her husband did was they, they bought that brand new Cadillac, but they were members of the bath club. And so this was like driving Miss Daisy. When I purchased the vehicle from her, she said, you know, I want to stay connected to the car. You seem like a nice young man. So drive the car down to the beach and take me to the tides and you'll be my guest for dinner. So we would go there for Sunday brunch where they served champagne. And so Mrs. Hotchkiss and I would sit in the dining room oh where gosh. Marilyn and Joe were diners. 
And after a few glasses of the champagne, she used to, I could see her gesturing with her hand and, and she took great delight in telling me the story. And I know she loved my reaction. She would often say, you know, and there Marilyn sat with Joe across from her. And so we, she would, you know, she was a regular there. So she would bring the old time servers to the table and they would just tell me wonderful stories of their recollections. So this area was the um, spring training for the Yankees. And so Maryland is connected not only to the tides, but also to Crescent Lake Park in downtown St. Pete, where the Yankees actually played and Al Lopez Field. And so mm-hmm. I remember when the tides was being raised It was a a very sad time. The property became extremely valuable for high-rise condominiums. And so uh, there was a huge auction of the the contents. And when they were eventually, when the building was plowed and the new high-rises were erected, Marilyn and Joe featured very heavily in the advertising. You know, come purchase a condo here on North Reddington Beach where Marilyn Monroe and Joe DiMaggio stayed. Well, you know what, Gary, that also, it seems like that happens in that area. And there's also other hotels that claim to be the the same thing, but it's really the tides, right? Yeah, that's very disappointing. There's another really grand hotel. Um, There's several of them and I appreciate all of them. But when I, when I see them online now, they, they make the claim that it's like Washington slept here, you know, Joe and Marilyn slept right. here, but, but we know, we know it was, it was, it was the tides. Was the and tides. I know the room number because I stated it many times. The, the reservation clerks knew the number and were willing to share that. And I know that was accurate because it was uh, repeated from multiple people throughout many of my stays. Right. Hey, Gary, do you have any old photos of that time period in that room by any chance? Because that would be cool. Be I, and no, I, cer- I certainly do. Yeah, they, they, were, um, they were very accessible to the We to should the post press. them on Facebook for people to see because that would be really cool to, to see if we can give them a glimpse of that time period. So many just... of them are, are black and white, but there's yep. a gentleman by the name of Morgan Blackburn, and he has an independent film about Marilyn called Reliving Marilyn. And wouldn't you know, his um, grandfather was a guest at the tides at the time Marilyn and Joe were staying there oh, and I've cool. seen his grandfather's color home movies and they're taken at the very same time the the very famous black and white pictures of Marilyn and Joe were taken by the press under the cabana and it's wonderful to see Marilyn in color her um, her bikini top is is like a bright uh, purple or a lavender and he's got great shots of of them in these home movies, which appear in the beginning of his film. Wow. Wow. That's really, I mean, and some of the other actors that we had in this episode, uh, we talked about Jason Dow and we have a young little actor. We really tried to stay in the age groups of, of the people that we were actually uh, casting and a young talented actor named Nolan Barnett actually is our Jason Dow. He's wonderful. Yeah, he's he definitely has that sweetness and the age appropriate of that that time period. That's right. I just also want to say that you'll find on the internet and even some YouTube channels that there is a compilation of some of these black and white photos of Joe and Marilyn at the beach. And one of the ones we actually put in the show were where Joe and Marilyn were walking along the shore and Joe picks up a horseshoe crab. So that's why that moment is in the program, because there's an actual photo of that, believe it or not, <laughs> of him showing the horseshoe crab to Marilyn. Marilyn going, ah, put it back in the ocean. Her affinity for not hurting animals and wanting to take care of them. You know, so she's like, put it back in the ocean. And uh, so, you know, that's the kind of detail and research that we go into, looking at photos and plugging things in that trying to recreate these. And, you know, when Gary showed me these movies that I saw, the clip of that, I said, that's exactly the moment in the scene where you've got all these people around. And, you know, that's part of part of our show. So it's, it was amazing to see what we had already written to verify that we had gotten it right when you're actually able to see real film of, of that moment that you were hearing in the story. So that was really exciting. One of the other things I want to commend in this episode, uh, especially from episode one again, is our amazing couple who are playing Joe and Marilyn in yep. this in the series. And we have to we're going to talk a lot about Aaron Gavin, 
So the fabulous, I like to say, the fabulous Erin yeah. Gavin. Yes. Uh, because yes. she is uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, finding her was like finding a needle in a haystack. Yeah, that was, you know. And well, because there's a lot of impersonators that impersonate the Marilyn Monroe persona, but we have to get the real Marilyn, and she's got a really beautiful heart, similar to Marilyn and her lightness sometimes, even when you're just talking to her as Aaron, will remind you a lot of Marilyn Monroe. She truly captures her spirit. Yes. I believe, and yes. in, in her natural um, speaking voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had listened to hours and hours, whatever was available of Marilyn's, the way that Marilyn speaks. And because in her sentences, she jumps around, she changes the the grammar, changing the grammar. She goes back and forth. And it's really funny because when you read the the letter to Greens in episode one that I referred to, she writes like that, too. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's hard to understand sometimes what exactly because she yeah, yeah, yeah she'll contradict herself as well. So it's it makes it really sometimes challenging to really piece together what she's really trying to say. The right? chronology jumps yeah, exactly. Yeah. So as when you hear like the the Belmont interview or the um, Richard Merriman interview, which are both available online, you can you can check those out in audio. She does that. She has this way of speaking about something, and then she'll jump back in time forward in time, or she'll just refer to it from a whole different point of view. <laughs> and it's like, what did she say here? And I'm trying to figure out what is the dramatic thread of what actually happened in this moment. And it's, yeah. it, it's challenging on that. That's in her speech pattern. So um, Aaron and I worked on that. I said, you know, go listen to those. And then as she's reading the dialogue, she does the pauses and the up and down tone of the voice and all that. So and I, mean, I and she, I she really she really was worked really hard on getting getting the sound as, as close to Marilyn as possible. And we really and I, have to commend her for that. Really do. And the other thing, I don't know if you remember this in one of the recordings that we did. Um, so Randall and I would give give comments and she came back with this is how you know hard of a worker she is she goes no actually when you listen to the audio that she does it this way so we were i think we were telling her to do an inflection or something like that and it was like no no that's not the way she says it in this audio (laughs) period i was like wow you know that's really uh somebody that's doing her homework and we need somebody that you know captures the essence of her because it's not an easy whoever plays marilyn it's just not an easy role to play and the the other role that we cast was Ron Hayden in uh, playing Joe DiMaggio, and we had to make sure that there was a connection between the two of them. And that's not always easy to do, especially if you're just doing the voice. There's still you have to feel that heart connection. Yeah, and Ron, he's terrific as well. And if you haven't heard our episode three, uh, you'll hear Ron, and he plays Dr. Ralph Greenson. And he is just as amazing in that role as he is as Joe. So um, that's a an episode that talented actor. Yeah, he's a very talented guy, and uh, I was amazed by his portrayal of Greenson. And so that's how he got the role of Joe DiMaggio, <laughs> because I was just like, wow. That's I mean, I because Greenson's voice is you can go there. There's lots of clips of it online, so I knew what his voice was. So when I heard Ron do it, I said. You nailed it. I mean, that was yeah. great. Yeah, it's it's a hard accent to get right. That sort yeah. of you know, the little bit of New York twang in there. And I just want to say something about the beginning of this episode when Joe is sitting. And this this took some research. Let me tell you, um, <laughs> to figure out what would be happening in this moment where Joe goes to start to visit Marilyn at Columbia Presbyterian, and there's no dialogue, there's no conversation because. As he promised, he was giving Marilyn space for her to work through her own trauma. And he, he had promised to do that, and he let her have that. So we, we attempted to give a moment what that was like, and when Norman and Hedda Rostin came to visit, Norman Rostin in his book describes that moment where, as, as the narrator talks about that, the nurse was dabbing her face, and Marilyn looked over him, and she seemed like the light had gone out of her. And that's in the scene. So we're using different sources of the same moment from different books and different people who knew Marilyn. It's like um, it's like pieces of a puzzle. You know, we have all of these pieces from different sources. And as we begin to put them together in a cohesive way, we begin to develop a clear 
image or picture of what was going on in Marilyn's life. We don't, we don't have 100% of the pieces. Many of the pieces are missing. But in doing the research, you know, that's what's so exciting is that you can spend days and weeks for just one little nugget of information. But when you have that piece and several others and have the ability to connect them, now yep. you have a larger insight and it, it's so satisfying in the way that it comes together. And that was our intention to find as many accurate pieces that are mm -hmm. possible. And we're and doing this decades later when many of the pieces are just lost. I love what you're saying about connecting and the other person that we really need to give a big shout out to who connects the pieces together is our wonderful narrator, Brad Highland. I mean, yes, we, you know, indeed. he was a wonderful find for us and, and really moves the story along too. And so big shout out to you, Brad. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks to Brad. He's also the voice of Santa in Elf on the Shelf. So if you're <laughs> a fan many of commercials, you, and, and a com I heard a, I heard a, a commercial the other day. I said, that's Brad. <laughs> he's all, he's all over the place. It's amazing. He's he has that. Over. It's a smooth velvety voice is, yeah. is oh, the yeah. way I describe his voice. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I we, love it. Yeah, so we hope you all, hope you all like it. And I just also say, in this episode, we, we have a glimpse into Patricia Newcomb. Yes. Oh, who, yeah. um, who has been a very loyal friend to Marilyn. She's, she really has kept Marilyn's confidence over the years. She has been approached many times to um, break those confidences, to publish a book. And she is so faithful and loyal to Marilyn that she will, she will never do that. And so we wanted to capture that special relationship that Ms. Newcomb had with Marilyn. Patricia Newcomb is one of those significant pieces that we still have available to us. And she has very graciously accepted my phone calls over the years and has been willing to talk about Marilyn with me. And not and, very many people have that access, Gary, and uh, yeah. the ability that she trusts you enough that you're not going to exploit some of the things that she's saying and, and keep confident the things that she doesn't want to uh, put out there. And I think, you know, that level of trust is important because she's one of the last people that are alive that actually knew Marilyn well. I personally have great respect for her, and I'm very happy that Marilyn um, had Pat Newcomb as a friend. Yeah. You yeah. know, considering how many people, uh, so many people betrayed her, uh, not only in life, but after life as well. So what were you going to say, Randall? Yeah. yeah. I thought you were going to add something. I, I, yeah, I was going to add something to that, um, <clears throat> to that moment where uh, Marilyn is coming out of Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. So what you're hearing in that scene is the actual moment in time. I have to give thanks to, and I don't even know who it was, but someone took the, the, not only just the film footage, but the soundtrack of that exit from Columbia Presbyterian and cleaned up the sound for us. <laughs> it's a YouTube, Thank you very it's, much. It's a YouTube video. And I found this YouTube video and I said, boy, that sounds really good from that. Crystal clear. Crystal clear Crystal and everything. Clear. So that scene is as close as you can get to the actual moment in time as you're listening to that scene. Go back and listen to it. We did add... At the exact moment in the film, you'll hear the reporter ask a question and Marilyn responds. And we inserted that at the exact moment. It is over the dialogue in the film clip. So that's just in that moment. You hear the background sounds and everything like that. Thus, that's actually the real sound of that entire moment in time in the scene that you that's, hear in the show. That's how that's the level of authenticity that we're going for, folks, as we do this series. If there's something like that, it's in the show. If we even have Patricia Newcomb telling Marilyn that there's photographers um, outside the hospital perched in the window of an apartment directly across the street. And uh, we know that is true. We're not sure that Pat Newcomb was aware of that at the time, but we know that that photographer was shooting and his photographs have been published all over the, the internet. And he has, uh, he talked about getting access to a woman's apartment so that he could shoot uh, Marilyn exiting the hospital amid that mob of, um, press photographers and reporters it's um it's almost uh, to watch it it's kind of claustrophobic to see how they're reaching into Marilyn's space and just gathered around that vehicle as she's attempting to get in and drive away and this woman had just recently been discharged from a psychiatric unit where she had spent 
a significant amount of time in crisis. And Marilyn appears just so carefree and effervescent, which is her ability to act. Yeah. She's being <laughs> into really, the Marilyn really Monroe persona, right? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're seeing it in that film clip. If you see it, yeah. that's, that's Marilyn. You think of... When you listen to episode one and two, you know what just happened to her, but you see her in that film clip, and it's like she yeah. seems completely normal. That's yeah, you, the power think, of her yeah. ability to become this, you know, become this person as she talks and, about. And I think that's why people get confused, and when they say, "Oh, she looks so happy," and she was so happy at the end of her life, you don't really realize what's going on behind closed doors and really what's happening. We're, we're, that's what we're trying to do in this podcast. Behind the icon. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Behind the icon. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's how we come up with our title. Um, and, and we'll get into the, uh, you know, Patricia Newcomb character later, and we'll definitely profile the actress that plays her as well. So, cause she's going to be in more episodes of, obviously she's a very main figure in, in Marilyn's life. Right. Is there, before we wrap up this, uh, companion podcast after the show anything you guys want to add before we close you know this relationship between joe dimaggio and marilyn joe was there for marilyn during this significant crisis in her life and this is joe making amends he hadn't been emotionally responsive to marilyn in the past and in the work that he did through his own therapy this was him having a corrective experience uh, with Marilyn to be present for her emotionally in a way he had never been able to before. And so he really rose to the occasion. You know, there, there's allegations that he had targeted Marilyn with domestic violence and uh, was very emotionally detached to her. And so during this period in his life. He's definitely making amends and he's trying to be there for her emotionally. This is coming from a man who was not educated, who had, he didn't have a lot of insight into his own emotions. And so we have to give Joe some credit for yeah. listening to Marilyn, who yeah. encouraged him to get involved in his own therapy. And he did that and he was making an effort and we do mm. know that they were very close uh, for the remainder of her life. Yeah. Um, yeah. She maintained that relationship with him and with his son. And most significantly, Marilyn was a conduit between Joe and Joe Jr. Joe Jr. used to say that, that his father was always at his best when Marilyn was around. <laughs> and she was still, I mean, yeah. Joe, Joe Jr. called her the last few hours of her life. She was loaning him money. They were still a family up until yeah. the end of Marilyn's yeah. life. They were still a family. Yeah. 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 That's, it's just, that's, it's a, it's a love story. And that's why we wanted to do a love story as our second episode, because that relationship was so important to both of them. He was quite the protector. Yeah. We will continue with that story of their relationship in subsequent episodes, especially in season two, maybe exactly. even beyond that. But yeah, I want to say one thing. If you heard this episode, there's a moment when Marilyn is with our character Jason on the on the beach, and there's something that happens. And you, you heard it, and she has this flashback moment. So I'm going to give everyone a little tidbit here. Why that scene is in there, you have to listen to the rest of the series to understand why <laughs> we put that in there. Because there's something about Marilyn that You're very, such a tease, Randall. very <laughs> few people realize about her life. It's not been talked about hardly at all by any biographer that we discovered. So I'm giving you this little why that scene is in there, because there's other scenes that are going to relate to that flashback in subsequent episodes. All right. Well, this is a wrap for Norma Jean, Discovering Truths. I'm Nina. I'm Randall. And I'm Gary. Until next time, hold a good thought for Marilyn and hold a good thought for yourself. Mm -hmm.